Truth Seeker and or its affiliates are not responsible for any strange phenomena that may occur during or after listening to this podcast, which may include the following. Heightened senses of awareness, psychic abilities, UFO sightings, alien contact, time loss, out-of-body experiences, ringing in the ears, ESP, lucid dreaming, increased synchronicities, astral projection, telepathy, stronger intuition, levitation, miraculous healings, and or remote viewing. Please be advised to listen at your own discretion. What's up, ladies and gentlemen? We're now locked into another episode of the Truth Seeker podcast. I'm excited and delighted to be here with you guys tonight. I have an awesome show planned, an awesome guest lined up. We've been trying to make this happen for a while, and we finally got it to work. So we're going to jump into this interview here very quick. I want to give a quick shout out to some of the people who are supporting right now on Patreon.com. So everybody who's my monthly supporters, you guys get free music. Um, that's unreleased week to week. We just put up a new song yesterday, brand new track that I released. It's available. Getting so much good feedback from that song. It's a song called Alpha. And so to, you know, what that song means, the the name of the title, um, you have to actually listen to the song to find out. So um, everybody who is supporting on on Patreon, thank you guys so much for what you're doing there. You are making it so where uh, independent creators such as myself, musician, podcaster, is able to live month to month from what you guys uh, help us do there and, and, and fund what we're doing. It means so much that uh, you guys are helping over there. So head on over to patreon.com backslash true seeker to sign up to give and quick shout out to the newest members of the, the, uh, the true seeker family on Patreon. We have Tina Carter, Tina, thank you so much. You've been um, here um, watching every broadcast that we do for probably the past month. I've I seen you in the chat room, holding it down. Um, Alan, somebody signed up just the name Alan, not really sure who you are, but Alan, thank you so much for what you're doing. And Josh Austin, and then Adam Starseed. Thank you guys so much for what you guys are doing. It means the world to me that you guys actually care and want to see me release more music and do more interviews and all this good stuff. So without further ado, I'm going to bring on my guest tonight. Uh, tonight I'm speaking with Hope Medford from the group Medicine for the People. Uh, she does so much other stuff. She is uh, bringing healing through the art, through music, creativity, um, she is a percussionist. She deals with healing. She's an environmentalist. She's a painter, artist, and she's a mother. She does so much stuff. I, I really don't even know where to go with, with the interview. So I have my questions that I want to ask. So hopefully hopefully tonight we'll, we'll be able to get into s- some discussion. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Nice to be here. Oh, yeah. So like I said, we've been trying to make this happen for a while. The the, um, the time zones are, are a crazy issue that I have to deal with with podcasts. I talk to people all over the world, and it's always trying to pin it down and remember and do the math. You know, it's always <laughs> yeah. it's always funny dealing with it, but we got it to work. So, again, yeah. welcome to the show. First your appearance. <laughs> yeah, totally. So th- there's so much to talk about, um, and so there's so many levels that we can connect on. Um, I want to say thank you, first of all, for, for the music. Um, when, I, when I found Medicine for the People, probably 2014 or so, 
Um, okay, yeah. It was when I was going through through an, an encounter and just having my awakening experience, and you guys came on and um, you know were pretty much the the soundtrack for my awakening. You, Trevor Hall, and then had the chance to meet you guys in New Orleans. I seen you guys in New Orleans, and we met there and right. just connected. So I want I want to kind of start there because your music has been a catalyst for awakening for me, right? And then for so many people, I mean, we, there's tribes and tribes and, and, and families of people who have been impacted by the music and been taken on spiritual journey. Talk a little bit about the music being a catalyst for promoting spirituality and, and essentially taking people down that path. Sure. Yeah. Great question. Thank you for bringing that up. And, um, you know, the way I see it and the way I feel it is that sound is a frequency, right? And um, I guess they even said, you know, in the beginning there was the word. And I feel like that word and that sound is a frequency and it's a vibration. And ultimately, I believe we're all made of energy and we're all just a vibration we're vibrating energy and so we're made up of frequencies and so the reality is that um we all have a biorhythm and that rhythm can be in sync or it can be out of sync and i feel like a lot of time when there's disharmony or disease in our culture um we get out of sync in our rhythms, right? And particularly, I think, in American culture, there's a lot of lack of music and, um, you know, rhythmic music. There's a lot of disharmony um, and discordious music as well. But um, but it's it's overall, we see a lot of uh, depression in the American culture. I mean, they, I heard something about 40% of people are on antidepressants in American culture. I don't know if that's true. I hope it's not. But... Um, but we are aware of that being true. Um, there are other cultures that I've spent a good amount of time in where I see music is more prevalent and people are happier. And I have to believe that, um, that there is a correlation between those two things. Um, I first, um, as you mentioned, you know, began as a percussionist and will always be a percussionist at heart, a drummer. And um, when I first really started getting more and more serious about drumming, um, I went to West Africa and I lived with a West African family and um, the, the master drummer in his family, um, the father told me that he would be called to households to actually heal people with his drumming and that that was passed on from father to son. You know, it was a lineage that you were born into being a drummer. Not just anybody could pick up a drum, actually. Wow. You had to be born into being a drummer in their tribe. and um, But then they were taught rhythms specifically that were used for healing. Um, I also know from my own research, um, and I worked as a, my own work as a midwife. I was actually a licensed and certified midwife for a number of years, um, practicing natural, holistic, out of hospital birthing, um, that there are ancient birth rhythms that go all the way back to Egypt, Egyptian times. Um, and so rhythms and drumming um, and music have been used um, in powerful rites of passage, such as birthing, you know, the human experience beginning and, um, and for healing from shamans in all cultures around the world. So um, I feel like for myself um, to bring it home that I never had the intention of being a professional musician. And um, I know plenty of people that do. Um, but for me, I was always just on a journey to serve humanity in whatever way that was shown to me. And that was always my prayer. And drumming for me was a a joy and a spiritual practice that I did along the way on the side of the other work that I was doing, um, which originally, you know, started with um, training as a midwife and attending births. And, um, and then I, as you mentioned, got involved and helped start a nonprofit in uh, Portland, Oregon, where I actually helped start uh, a community farm that was primarily an education center for teaching people how to grow uh, organic food, uh, teaching permaculture, um, as well as environmental and social justice issues. And, um, 
on that land, um, we would bring youth groups out and I would teach uh, drumming out in the garden, drumming with nature. And um, a lot of times um, the at-risk youth that would be interacting with the drums would either be freaked out or really empowered by the use of a drum. Mm -hmm. um, you know, first of all, it's, um, it's a bit overwhelming to feel like they could have this loud of a voice, right? Because the drum is seen as such a loud voice. But then when they actually are invited into it in a welcoming way that's, um, that shows that they're not going to fail, you know, creating a very safe community oriented way to get involved in music and uh, specifically with rhythm that, um, that then it turns into an empowerment process. And so that um, has always been the heart of it for me was um, at that farm is actually where I met Nako. Um, gosh, I guess it was probably 11 or 12 years ago now. And um, the day we met, he came out to one of the bonfires we were having under the full moon. And I was drumming by the fire. And he showed up with Max Ribner, who's our horn player. And um, the two of them started jamming along. And then within about 20 minutes, Nako was yelling. He's like, we've got to do this. This is amazing. We've got to play together. And we had our first practice the next day and our first gig that week. And I certainly never knew from around that fire that we would end up playing for hundreds of thousands of people yeah. and that it would become a job for me. Um, but I just always stayed true to that feeling of um, sharing this love, you know, through the stage. And, you know, the first times I got on stage, I really felt like, I, it wasn't me, like I didn't want to be on stage, but then my friends had a conversation with me, sh sharing with me the perspective that actually when you're up there, you have the opportunity of sharing a prayer through the music with more people, as many people as, you know, are coming to this um, and that can hear you. And so that rang true for me. And I realized um it's all about your intention when you're yeah. on the stage and what you're doing there with your energy. And so I've always held that um, for myself as being a channel and just really opening my energy as a channel and protecting myself in the way that I'm only letting in love and light. Um, so I'm specific about how I'm open, but also allowing that energy to flow through me and go to the audience and be as he as strong of a healing energy as possible for the people there present. Um, and that's always been very powerful for me. And honestly, that journey and that experience of being that channel on stage and with Medicine for the People for so many years is part of why I was able to maintain the really rigorous lifestyle of daily touring. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, whenever we connected um, a couple years ago and I, I, I contacted you about, you know, possibly doing a song together, and we did yeah. the song "Our Return," and uh, yeah. it's a beautiful song. I I, yeah. I get to this day. There's so many people like that's their song. Like on, on, out of all my work, it's that song, and wow. it's so it's so mu it's so beautiful because it just the uh, just the uh, the essence of it just to help you to ground and to return back to to nature to source energy and and really just a focus of nature with that song. So thank you yeah. so much again for being a part of that. But whenever. Yeah, when it, whenever I reached out to you for it, um, you wanted to check me out and just, and see and see what I'm about, what I do, and, and then yeah. so you went to my Facebook page, went to my website, yeah. and you've seen yeah. a lot of a lot of religious uh, uh, articles and the um, yeah. mention of Jesus yeah. and things like that. So you wanted to make sure that I knew what what you were about, right? Um, and just to make sure that I was cool with it uh, from coming from a religious background and standpoint. So. Um, studying what what I have and, and studying the comparative theology, we start seeing the the, the different uh, streams of whether it's religion or tradition that that's the same, and that's what I study versus what makes us different, like what makes us the same. So, um, tapping into music, music is a universal language. All the religions practice it. All, all the religions deal with music. So, dealing with music in the church culture. In the like culture, it, it, there's a big difference of singing a song about God or about the Creator than singing a song to the Creator. And when you do that, you tap in 
to this special place. You essentially go into this meditative trance state, leave the leave the, this atmosphere of what we know to be real, and we tap into another realm. And we deal with energies. There's there's love and stuff that comes through, like you're saying, even in the churches. And this is the, this is the beautiful thing. It's that it, it knows no boundaries. It just is. It's universal law. It's truth. So talk a little bit about the place that you go to. like Because I, 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 I love... Seeing somebody perform, and they people used to always tell me to say, You want to engage the crowd, make sure you're working the crowd, that's good. But I love to see somebody close their eyes and just tap out and tune in and just go somewhere. And that's what you do, and you go there, you're a conduit for the energy to bring it through, and it's of love and light. So, talk a little bit about that trance state of going in through music, okay? Yeah, um, you know, it's interesting because. I think a lot of people have told me about that. They say, oh, yeah, you close your you close your eyes or even see your eyes roll back in your head or, you know, while you're drumming. And it's funny because I honestly, I don't think I have memory of doing that because I think I'm so in the moment and kind of like I said, like spirit is coming through me. So it's not that I can even articulate right now what I'm thinking about or um, what that feels like. Other than um, just, you know, reiterating that um, that I'm completely open and um, and really mm -hmm. allowing this like bliss to just come through. Um, I also, you know, there's a part of it about supporting your bandmates, right? Like supporting the energy that's up there. And I'm always aware of what Nako is going through when we're on stage together, as well as, you know, where my other bandmates are. So there's a piece of like, holding this as a team or as a crew, you know, together on stage, um, which is really important to me. I really prefer performing with a crew than by myself. Um, again, because I never felt like the energy is like about me, but I feel like it's about like showing a united front and trying to be as good of an example as possible of, you know, how humanity can represent. And, um, but yeah, the, um, you know, the, the, the energy that comes through sometimes it's, uh, it's also, it can be depending on the gig and how many people are out there. It can also be closing my eyes to focus and like hear it. I think through my inner ear is what I'm also doing. And I'm kind of like listening for what is spirit telling me to play, but it's a, it's a, um, it's a non-intellectual space. It's more of just listening and translating what I'm hearing into my hands and into the rhythms that I'm playing. And um, so I'm actually glad you asked that question because I, as you're, as I'm talking, I'm realizing that that is part of it is there's a listening to the inner ear that comes through. And, you know, I remember once when I was in India, I spent about 10 months in India when I was 21 um, doing my own like spiritual pilgrimage. And, um, I went to a place where there was a group called the Sikhs and that's their religion. And they were doing this attunement of the inner ear to hear God better. And I was like, wow, that's really interesting. Like they actually, they're literally attuning their inner ear to hear the divine more effectively. And even though I didn't really make, I didn't really understand it. I still thought, well, why not? I might as well try. Right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> if anything good comes out of it, it'll be worth the effort. And, um, and he, you know, it, I think I understand it just a little bit more is just kind of that opening of your own consciousness so that you just hear that inner voice, you know, whether it's intuition or it's actually hearing a sound, you know, um, speaking to you. Um, but for me, yeah, I, when I'm on stage and I'm going deep with a, with a large group, you know, in front of me, I feel like it's my, um, it's my kuleana, which is a uh, Hawaiian word. It kind of means responsibility, but it's also a blessing. You know, it's not, a, it's not a weight. It's still very light, even though it's a responsibility is what that word implies. And I feel like it's my kuleana when I'm on stage to um, respect the audience um, by giving them my best and um, and making their time as effective as possible, you know, by showing up and holding space um, for the music to come through, that my job is to um, bring through the most healing vibrations that I can. And, you know, that can be very loud and powerful sometimes. Um, you know, I do feel like um, 
because I'm a woman drummer, there is a piece that's important uh, that I show up in my strength as well as in my uh, subtlety on stage. And it's also my joy because I have both sides to me as, you know, all of us do in our balanced ways. But, um, but as a woman, I do know that um, when I play strong and I play fiercely, um, that that divine energy also can be an inspiration um, for other women and girls, you know, young women, teenagers are often looking for female role models to see women in their strength and using their voice. Um, as you know, there's been, you know, generations globally of women that um, aren't heard equally as men on our planet, in our government, you know, um, in the media. So, um, so it's always special and it's always a blessing when we see men and women working together, just like you and I are in this interview right now, um, you know, sharing space and listening to each other and creating a room for women's voices to be heard. But certainly as a drummer, it's a really unique role because it's kind of more unexpected. Um, there's not that many women drummers out there that we see on stage. So, um, so I think that's a piece of it too, is I often feel like I'm both playing for the women out there that really look up and need to see other women really uh, claiming their voice and using it in an empowered way and all, as well as playing for the men that also really appreciate and love and respect that because uh, men want uh, women to be their equals as well. I mean, that's ultimately what we all want and um, we're just in that journey of creating that and helping each other. But, um, but I do feel like uh, this musical journey for me has also uh, been a part of, of that piece. Dealing with the energy, and this is something that that I have close friends who have who have wanted me to look into it, and I haven't really, um, because dealing with um, Christianity, most of us in the South where I'm from, we we it's the Bible Belt, right? And so we hear about Father God, right? And we know that aspect of the of the masculine of you know the Father who who corrects you, but he teaches you, he guides you, and as a as a as a uh, father and it's beautiful too because there's a scripture in the bible that says that he becomes a father to the fatherless and we have a whole generation of people who are coming up without fathers and right. to understand that the great spirit whatever name you want to call it is a, div a, a divine uh, aspect that will become your father your nurturer but right. we don't deal with the divine feminine which i think mm -hmm. in the christianity term it would be the Holy Spirit, which is the loving aspect, the motherly aspect. So uh -huh. I haven't studied much of it, but I've got a lot of friends who are really big into it. I was like, who not better to have on, on the show than than Hope, who is totally, uh, you know, well versed in, in, in some of the stuff. I see some of the stuff that you post and I'm intrigued. Even my wife's intrigued. Some of it sounds far out when we talk about the divine feminine or the goddess energy and stuff like that and owning up to the person that you created, like these energies and ways for you to connect. And um, and some of it seems out the box from a, coming from a Christian perspective. We got a lot of Christians who watch this show. We got a lot of people who who, who don't claim any religion. But yeah. I guess if I could, I guess go right to it. Something that would seem interesting to talk about the moon energy and, yeah. and about how, um, you know, the uh, I guess the women's menstrual cycle is synced with the moon. And in, right. in the Christian tradition, we're look that's looked at as like a bad thing. The menstrual cycle. Talk okay. a little bit about that and how that's something that it's supposed to be embraced and, and, and empowered as well, you know? Great. Okay, thank you. That's a great question. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I'm going to start with my own uh, journey a little bit. Um, so I, you know, I was confirmed into the Presbyterian Church. Um, I have a Christian background, um, but it was a very open-minded one. And um, so I'm very familiar and comfortable uh, with around Christianity. Um, and then when I got to be about 18, 19, I was invited to um, like a women's circle at the full moon. And um, it was a really special place for me. Uh, I didn't really know about women's circles before. And it was basically a space where women could come together and um hold hands and be peaceful and share open heartedly, you know, but also um, talk about what is, you know, 
goddess energy just being the feminine aspect of God, right? So um, it's not like it's one person or something, but just that feminine divine energy as the goddess energy and mother goddess as being um, the abundance of the earth. You know, she who gives life, she who um, births humanity, she who gives us our fruits and our foods and um, kind of celebrates life. You know, uh, it's not an austere um, take on spirituality like some practices are, but more of a celebration energy. Um, And then the energy of the moon um, being when we would meet, you know, under the full moon to gather. Um, The moon is obviously the whole earth is in rhythm with the moon. Um, So the tides of the ocean move with the rhythm of the moon and a woman's menstrual cycle is in sync with the whole earth. And so, and we have to be because we are birthing life. Life comes through us. Humanity comes through a woman's womb. So the more in sync with, we are with the earth, the more in sync, you know, the next generation will be. Um, So the moon is one aspect of that. And, It's interesting. I feel like, you know, the moon comes out in, you know, celebrating the moon is is celebrating in the nighttime, right? And celebrating the sun, which is sometimes seen as more masculine, is, you know, in the light. And so one could compare the light and the dark and say one is good and one is bad. But what's fascinating is as you delve deeper, you know, what you realize is like any yin and yang or black and white, they're both potent and powerful and they actually depend on each other. Um, I studied some Buddhism when I was older and it kind of, it talks about a quality called interdependence and instead of independence, right? Because they're saying nobody's actually independent. You have to everyone is actually interdependent. Everything actually depends on each other. So like you really can't have light if you don't have the dark, right? You can't have, um, you can't have, you know, white unless there's something to compare it to, you know, something that's black. Oh, yeah. um, and so um, this duality, you know, is, is, is critical to have both sides. Yeah. But I think it's also um, too easy to say one is good and one is bad. Whereas you have the opportunity to say they're both just are, it's just, they just are, it just, they just exist. So we don't have to judge them as right or wrong. We can accept both, right? It's um, so anyway, the moon energy and being in the dark, what that is often, um, holding is this energy of mystery and um this energy of um inner wisdom intuition those things that are you know that intuition and inner mystery i think are often seen as more like feminine qualities right and then the masculine is more out in the sun and um you know really heard and uh and the and the women's quality is more introspective and I would not say passive, but I would say, you know, (laughs) introspective, um, that deepening within, um, that can happen in the nighttime. And so, um, so for myself, you know, I have a strong affinity with the moon. I love the moon and I love the energy of the moon. And I do feel and believe that there is a particular you know, power or energy that's present within the moon cycles if you sync up with them. But that's available to anyone, you know, man or woman. Um, Also, um, as you're talking about the menstrual cycle, I appreciate you bringing that up. Um, Like I mentioned, I worked as a midwife for about eight years, and I've actually attended and assisted with um, around 450 births, um, bringing in a lot of new life into this planet. And my full intention with that work is to make those experiences as sacred and gentle and empowering as possible for both mother and baby, as well as for father and family and um, keeping that a connected holistic experience for the family. Um, And I, I see birth as um, the strongest rite of passage that a child will ever go through or as they enter this planet, as well as the strongest experience a woman will ever go through, allowing a human being to come through her body. Um, 
So that empowerment, obviously, um, and that rite of passage begins with the menstrual cycle. Um, obviously, we have to have that blood. That blood is the uterine lining, and it's what the baby grows in. If that blood wasn't there, we wouldn't be able to grow a new human being. So, um, so there is the need to shed our shame around that blood and to look at that as um, the seed of new life and what a blessing it can be. And I know for me to gather with other women and just to have a few conversations in these circles really awakened that awareness for me of shifting from my period being a shameful time into being this beautiful thing where you can actually offer your blood back to the soil. You can put it on a plant and help it grow. You can use it to nourish something. Or at the very least, you can do whatever you do, but um, but do it with a consciousness that you're aware that this is the gift that allows you to be a life bearer on this planet. And it's an amazing gift. And um, as challenging as carrying a baby for nine months and then pushing it through your body is, which it absolutely is a sacrifice. On the other hand, it's, I can definitely say it's the most empowering experience I've ever had. And, um, and so to see it and to constantly uh, recognize it as an opportunity and as a gift and, um, and yes, that that blood is sacred as a result. And so I feel like we've done humanity a disservice by talking about um, this original sin that we're all born in and that that is, re that is connected with a woman's body and coming yeah. through a woman's body. Um, when actually, um, if we open our mind a little bit further, I feel like there's an opportunity to also see um, how sacred and uh, sensual experience the part the fact that it's a part of our part of our body that has the most like sense receptors you know that has the most sensation um, that it's it's actually the most uh, gentle births happen I can say as a midwife when the energy in the room is as beautiful when the baby comes out as the energy of when a couple create the baby in their bed together, that same love, obviously yeah. it's a different um, quality of it, but yeah. that, that quality of being in love and creating a life should be the energy that you feel in the room when the baby comes out into the world. And that woman should be made to um, feel that way and be honored for opening herself to bring this new life and letting that experience and that frequency be that high of a vibration for our next generation to come into the world. And that it's our responsibility really to, um, to allow both a mother and a child to have that intimate, loving, beautiful experience, even when there's challenges in the birth process to um, still be respected um, that that's coming from a sacred place and that a child's beginning is a beautiful thing that's being honored so when whenever you, and that, that's beautifully said so and and I, i'm new to all this but i've just seen pieces of it here and there so i wanted to get you on to, to, to ask you personally because i mean you're an expert in it versus reading some stuff online and reading articles uh, it's awesome having a podcast where i get the people who like <laughs> you know what i'm saying their, their life is devoted to this work and this research yeah. like i'm people were begging me to research flat earth yeah. And I'm like, I'm not really going to get into it. And I had one of the, the most leading experts in the field come on and then school me on the show on it. So I just, I, it's awesome that we, I, you know, get to have you on here and pick your brain about it. So yeah, I, thank I, you. Thank I, I, I kind of have a, kind of have a twofold question. Um, okay. So dealing with the midwife stuff, were you, were you um, assisting in the delivery or were you working more of like the energy making sure energy in the room, the music soothing and you creating a sacred space or was you doing both or what? I was definitely um, delivering babies. So um, my work as a midwife was the complete care provider in the pregnancy, doing all of the care throughout pregnancy, medical testing, as well as emotional support and talking with a family about what would create the, the birth room for them in a way that would 
be as sacred as they want it to be and what kind of music would they want and what kind of, you know, do they want candles? Do they not? You know, I'm very happy. I'm very happy to support people with whatever they want, whatever their spiritual belief is, or if they're atheist, you know, I, I see myself as a servant in the birth process to the next generation, to that baby that's coming through, as well as, you know, to the spirit of the parents, whether or not they're fully awakened. Um, you know, it's really um, such sacred energy, no matter what somebody's belief is, when their baby comes through, it is always a powerful experience that can change people and awaken people in new ways. So um, I was the medical care provider. I was delivering babies. I was doing um, all of the testing that they would need to have done if that was necessary. Um, although I, my approach certainly is to have as little testing and interference as absolutely possible. I'm trained from the National College of Midwifery, but my approach is also to be as hands-off as possible to allow the natural birthing process, um, as well as encourage uh, a family to be their own labor support. There's some fathers or partners to a woman in labor that want to be the primary um, support person in that labor process. And I love supporting families to be like that and to educate them to have the information they need to do that. And I'm still happy to be in the room, but hands off and um, helping just coach from a distance. If that's what somebody is more comfortable with, I'm just checking vitals and making sure the baby's safe and everybody's fine. Um, and I also really love to coach fathers to catch the baby if that's what they want to do or cut the cord. Like, um, that's really important to me to um, support the bonding of the family. I feel like keeping the family together and intact is one of the most important things you can do to support that baby's life. Mm -hmm. And when parents both, when the mother feels the integrity of her own birth process and is not violated or compromised by being exploited through interventions. And when a father feels empowered, like he has a role and he is important and he's connecting with his baby more than a doctor would be, I feel like that's critical for a man to feel his role as guardian and the stewardship of the birth of his next generation and his bloodline. Mm -hmm. um, then those parents will will have a deeper relationship from with their child from the very beginning and that will benefit that child's life and their life force i feel like will be stronger like there are so many subtle energies in a birth room i i call it a rite of passage because i feel like particularly the woman and baby they're it's like their energy is on fire. They're so awake and open to, for a woman to open enough to let a being through her body is not just a physical process, of course. And, um, and that baby as well, it's transforming from never having been on this planet to coming through. Um, so that rite of passage energetically is so powerful and is so on fire energetically that, um, that it's a potent time to, um, have as much love in the room as possible to allow that potency to be filled with love and for that um, baby and that birth to be infused with that love energy is something that you can, um, you can always call on throughout, throughout that child's life. That's, that's beautiful. And don't, I mean, even that, and then like the first few years, I think that I think are so important and it, 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 it hurts my heart to see, uh, people letting like nurseries and stuff raise their children the first couple of years and only getting right. to see the child at night and stuff like that. And I believe even in living in, in you know, in the West or whatever, like you, I believe that there are resources there for you to be able to do that. If you have to kind of, you know, not have all the money that you want to have just to stay home with your kid. Those for at least those first couple of years are so important um, to kind of yeah. talking about the birth. I wanted to ask you about this. So um, moving in a lot of the spiritualist circles, there's a term that's used, and I want to ask you, because you should have hands-on experience, you would know. They use the term birth trauma. And so we, as people are dealing with uh, past life regression or uh, anxiety, stuff that happened to them in their childhood, is do you know if there's any truth to the, the whole um, um, birth trauma that we have to deal with as, as adults sometimes? Yeah, great question. Thank you. Um, 
So I have studied this a bit and I have seen some things that have led me to, um, to yes, believe that it definitely exists in my understanding. Um, there's a term that's really fascinating. It's called limbic imprinting. So L-I-M-B-I-C, limbic. Um, I believe it's like the limbic part of the brain that's like the more reptilian part of the brain. So it's primal. Um, there's limbic imprinting that happens on your brain as you come through the birth canal when you're born. That imprint um, becomes a bit of a blueprint that follows you throughout your life is what I've been taught. Um, there's a fascinating woman who focuses on this and teaches it all over the world. And she's created a movie that's really brilliant called Birth Into Being, Birth Into Being, if anybody wants to check it out. Um, but limbic imprinting is fascinating. And seeing that um, or understanding that concept really makes you want to, again, have the most gentle and empowering birth for each child and each person that's coming in. Um, here's an example. Um, so there's, there was one baby that I know that was born and during her birth process, um, the, she was in a hospital and the doctors had to put, or they chose to put a fetal scalp monitor on her head. And that actually is screwed into their skull during labor. Um, and so it's a tiny screw that goes in because you can get your pulse out of the top of your head. And doctors will use that when they feel like they can't get the pulse out of the woman's belly because of the position the baby's in. So after that baby was born, for the next two or three years, she did not want anyone to touch the top of her head. So it was really fascinating. It's like, okay, that's just a physical, you know, imprint, right? If, um, you know, she had no other reason to have that, you know, feeling why she didn't want anyone to touch her head, but she had a physical trauma from that experience. Um, but there's also um, been a lot of research that children as they're in, as they're being born in their labor, if there's different interferences, right? So, so say a woman's having a natural labor process and then, um, a doctor decides to cut an episiotomy and use forceps and pull the baby out quicker than the mother would have naturally pushed the baby out, which sometimes happens for emergency reasons and sometimes is overused and has happened when it's not necessary. Um, those, those babies um, often have a harder time finishing projects in their life as an adult. So there's actually been research that's shown that certain interferences in the labor process create different personality types in adults. Mm -hmm. um, so I went to one class like that, that um, another thing to look at because it happens quite a bit is cesarean sections. Yeah. I was going to ask you about so, um, Yeah. So one thing that when people are choosing to have a cesarean voluntarily that families need to remember that in a natural birthing process, um, yes, your baby is being squeezed, you know, through the birth canal as it's coming through. It's being squeezed, right, by the muscles, the woman's muscles as it comes out. But that squeezing actually squeezes the baby's chest and squeezes the baby's heart, right? It's squeezing the whole body as it's coming through. So squeezing the chest actually helps the baby clear its lungs. Squeezing the baby's heart is like giving it its first couple pumps to get it going, right? So that's what you want when your baby's coming through because it's been in amniotic fluid and water the whole nine months. It's never breathed air before. So having that squeeze of the chest as it, and the lungs as it's coming through is actually helping the baby open its... Um, ability to breathe air for the first time. Um, I could name a whole bunch of effects like that, but those two are probably the most obvious. So coming through the birth canal is actually biologically perfect <laughs> to help a baby be born. When it's when it's when a woman is cut open and the baby is just lifted out of the abdomen of a woman, none of these biological uh, functions occur, um, and so. There is a lack of, well, first of all, the statistics of a baby being born in a C-section 
are, are less healthy than babies being born vaginally because of that, right? They're always taking more time to kind of come around and to start breathing and to looking as strong. Um, obviously, overall, C-sections can be a very healthy option, but the statistics are lower than a vaginal birth. What, what about um, even, because I know you're studying that, like, what about even where that name comes from? Have you? I'm sure you've yes. looked into that. That's insane. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, my understanding, it was like a doctor, right? It was named after. It was, it was, it was supposedly one of the, the, uh, the um, Caesars was right. going through and, and, and had an that's order right. to, yeah, cut the women yeah, open to, right. take, to take their babies out and uh, right. not, yeah, and to, you know, kill them or whatever. And that's, uh, that's insane <laughs> that we still use this, 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 this old, you know what I'm saying? These old world. Yeah, that's right. Terms, I'd forgotten that. Yeah. That's absolutely right. You know, and you can keep going in that direction with the conversation just to say also a lot of the modern gynecological care for women is actually based on work that was developed during World War II by the Nazis on Jewish prisoners, that they did a lot of medical experimentation and a lot of those um, uh, techniques that they came up with are still being practiced today. Yeah. It's, it's, so it's a serious it's, yes. thing. And, um, you know, there's a reason I, I'm impassioned about the field and it's the beauty, but it's also there is a lot of exploitation happening, um, uh, particularly in hospital processes that are being overused. And the reason why I'll tell you right now is because it's a huge money making um, scheme. And um, birth is the number one money maker in any hospital. The reason why is because women are healthy going in. They're not sick. It's not like a cancer patient or somebody who's like missing an arm who yeah. needs um, a surgery. It's a healthy person going in to have a healthy baby. And they, the World, World Health Organization says 92% of all women um, do not need interventions, that they're going to have a healthy baby. There's only about 8% of women that really need a cesarean section and, you know, extreme interventions. So um, all the other women that are getting those things, I mean, right now they say there's about 30% of women in the United States having cesarean sections, for example. So the extra, you know, 22 women per every 100 that are having these things, um, the hospital's making a huge amount of money off of them. And um, we could, we don't need to talk numbers, but you know, it's thousands and thousands of dollars. And when things like cesarean sections are being done inappropriately, then it often leads to a baby ended up in the intensive care unit for days or weeks. And that's thousands and thousands more dollars. Um, so there is a uh, agenda. And um, it doesn't mean our doctors are bad people. They're good people. Um, but there's just a protocol in a hospital that's actually created by insurance companies that are not healthcare providers and are not doctors. And those insurance companies are run by business people yeah. trying to make a living, right? So the point is to not blame, but to educate yourself and understand who you're working with and what the agenda and what the intentions there are. Um, and that's been a big process for me, helping women and seeing women in their birth processes when they don't have the experience that they want, when their babies perhaps are being taken away from them, when they want to keep them together and stay close, or when they're um, given surgeries, when they actually just wanted a few more hours to try to push their baby out naturally, but a doctor maybe said it's time and he has to go. Yeah, he has to go, um, for, so the, he has to go for the day. So he wants yeah. to rush it up. That's insane. Yeah. Well, Hope, I know you got to run. Uh, I've enjoyed hanging out with you. Thank you so much for coming on. And uh, Oh, yeah. It's been a um, pleasure. It's just so, uh, there's so many more questions, especially segues and stuff, man. I, have to I have know. We back should on. do a part two. We, sh we totally should because, you know, I like to get into some of the esoteric uh, understandings behind it. And a perfect segue w would be like talking about how, um, the whole birth trauma thing and, and cause we like to talk about aliens and spirits and interdimensionals and stuff like that on here. So, um, a lot of people are saying that the whole alien abduction phenomenon is people reliving their birth trauma. And it, and so you, you're laying in a bed, you wake up and you oh, see these people looking over you with okay. scaffolds and things looking over you. And, and they're yeah. saying that it's trauma from 
you know, from, from, from yep. being birthed and stuff. So that, that's yep. a whole nother segue, but yeah. promise me you'll come back on and we'll have that conversation. That'd be something. Yeah. Yeah. To no, it sounds interesting. It's been <laughs> really pleasure talking with you too. So yeah, it would be, it would be fun to do. Definitely. So everybody go and check out Hope Medford. You can check out all of her work at hopemedford.com. I'm pretty that's sure right. you could just type her name in on yeah, anywhere. Can do. And Derek, I brought, um, these are my two last latest CDs. This is Purify, and this one is Bring to Light. Bring to Light. So I got you, if you want to check out my music, these are my two latest. So enjoy. Definitely. I still, on there. I still have to get into your latest one, Bring to Light, but Purify was amazing. Uh, thank you. I oh, gotta get yeah. In. I got to get into the new one, definitely. So I Return is on there, so you'll get to yeah. check out uh, the, the, the remix. Such a blessing. That All right. song that you helped inspire. Thank you so much, Hope. It was so much fun. All right. Take care. Peace. All right. Bless. Thank you. Hope Medford, ladies and gentlemen. Medicine for the people. Soul Tribe. Good people, man. I uh, had the pleasure of meeting them. Um, I want to say 2014, I think it was. That's the, the date's coming up. Seen them in New Orleans. Got to meet Hope. Um, it was fun. We had a great time. And it was when they were still kind of, you know, making their way up the ranks. And um, we were at the show where, where they opened up for um, Soja on the tour. And there were so many people who had no idea who uh, Medicine for the People was. And they're like, hey, who's, the, who's these guys that are opening up? I was like, dude, they're better than Soldier Because we, we, we didn't go there to see Soja. So it was a blessing for us because after that show, I became a Soldier fan. So it was kind of kind of vice versa, but it was it was awesome seeing people who traveled to see them because they were like totally you know what I'm saying medicine tribe from like day one traveling to see them, but then seeing all the people who were like blown away because if you're a soldier fan and you check out medicine for the people and not even know who they are, you're blown away. Definitely check out their work and you know we say medicine for the people, but man, um, I know they have a like a revolving cast with hope is is such a, a part of that group man and to 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 watch her tap in to the spirit realm and and play her drums play the djembe play the percussions and sing man it's a it's a beautiful encounter and um, a lot of people are having their awakenings through their music and a part of that's influenced and infused into my work so i get those messages all the time where people are like dude i listened to your album 333 it took me to new levels. And even with the song that we have together, I return, we, we, you know, we did a collab feature together. And even from that song, like people are just like, Oh my God, I'm taken to new levels. I'm in tears listening to your music. So it's, it's awesome that I'm able to facilitate that in the lives of other people because hope and her message and, and her music and the same thing with LCOB, the lost children of Babylon, like that stuff did the same thing for me. So it's so cool to be able to pay that forward and to, to put out art and, and put out work like that. That's just facilitating awakening around the globe. So many people are interconnected and so many people um, in, in this, in this soul tribe family that we have and we're, we're connected by, by, by spirit and with intention and anything that brings about healing. You guys know we're about that like healing um, and, and healing through music. Come on. I mean, you guys know that I deal with a lot of um, people coming out of religion and out of Christianity. And uh, I hope I didn't scare her off with any of the Bible talks. Some, you know, so I don't think I did, but some people are weird about that. But uh, a lot of people are coming out of that and they want to make sense of stuff. And I'm telling you, in the South, you start talking about goddess energy. You start talking about the divine feminine and stuff. That stuff's not being discussed down here at all. So it's beautiful that that I have a lot of people locally who listen to this and they'll, they'll be able to at least research it after, after this, you know, me, even me li hearing it for the first time, I was like, goddess, what, what is that? We don't, you know, in the Bible belt, man, it's stuff. It's not encouraged to talk about that stuff. So I, I'm, I'm glad that there's an awakening happening. I'm, I'm part of it. Uh, you guys are a part of it. If you're listening this far into the show, if you're listening this far, um, you've heard something that has caught your attention or there's something that resonates deep down within you and you're a part of the family too. And so you have questions, uh, you have the answers as well within and you want to be a part of something greater than yourselves, which which we all are. And uh, so with that being said, man, 
I'm going to say again a huge thank you for everybody supporting my work um, through Patreon. That's that's the number one place to get anything that I put out. My music, um, the podcast, to get the updates. Um, we got you know a spe- special Facebook group that's only for people who are um, a part of the, the the membership over there. And I just put out a new song. Thank you guys for the kind words. I'm reading the, I'm reading the comment section even as we do this. And so there's a lot of there's a lot of love for for the new the new music and uh, a lot of love for hope in, the, in this chat room as well. You guys are awesome. But getting a lot of feedback on that new song, Alpha A F F A is the name of the song. And you got to hear the you got to hear the full song to actually understand what it means. And hopefully I kind of kind of stepped out on a limb there, but I think that it was it was done uh, in a really intricate way and um, was struggling over a name. And that's the name I picked. And you have to hear the song. Um, it'll be out to the general public um, sometime next year. Um, so Patreon's a way for you guys to hear new music before it even comes out to the general public, and you guys get access to it. There's a bunch of new music over there. So. With that being said, I'm going to say peace and shalom. We also have merch available. I got a bunch of merch on my website. People, you know, want to support. They want to rock the gear. We got a bunch of merch over there at truesicker.com. Uh, head on over there, buy some merch, and uh, support the work. I love each and every one of you guys. So with that, again, peace and shalom. Blessings on top of blessings. I love y'all. Peace. Yo, That's it for this episode, folks. To hear more episodes of the Truth Seeker podcast, head over to truthseeker.com. And if you're wanting to support the show and get rewards, go to our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash truthseeker.